see is you can buy their $79 product and it has a visual layout for doing that. And there is also a tool that will actually guess at all your sizes. So if you're doing um, uh, Get Data Back has a tool that's called RAID Reconstructor and it will, you can put your drives in there and it will actually try to determine the layout of the stuff. I've done a whole talk all on RAID, or several talks actually, all on RAID and actually how to reconstruct them from porn and other stuff. Um, and so if you go watch any, like I just did the DEF CON talk on all RAID, how to recover from porn and stuff. And then uh, I did Outer Zone. If you guys went to Outer Zone, I did a RAID reconstruction. How to do it visually by actually using graphics on the drive to actually figure out what your slice sizes are. Because that's your hard part is not knowing what your slice sizes are if you didn't set up the RAID array. There's a, JPEGs are very difficult to reconstruct and fragmentation on JPEGs is uh, very difficult, but there's a couple of them. There's a tool that's called Android that is, uh, it tries to do fragmentation recovery and actually tries to do predictive recovery of the files. There's probably two or three, but they've been, they're very, they started out as like scientific papers and gradually made their way into how do you deal with fragmentation. Well, there's a JPEG formula if you're actually doing them as JPEG, but if you're doing them as raw, then there's a whole other formula. But that's why I said that the fragmentation stuff is actually the best formulas for doing that so far. Somebody has done both uh, pictures, JPEGs, and has done MP3s. Uh, and there's an issue with the compression ratio and how the compression ratio, and that's the calculation they're actually doing. But raw, the only way that you're going to deal with raw files, because there's no compression, is to deal with the fragmentation itself. And so in most cases, you have to actually mount the file system depending on what it was that was written to the disk. And most cameras, it's FAT. So it's FAT32, actually, most of them. So, yes, sir? Now, uh, the way you fix that particular problem is you actually have to put the drive into what's called safe mode, which means I'm going to read content from the board, and I'm not going to I'm not going to pay attention to any requests. I'm just going to pause talking to the drive. You read all the code from the board and the drive, and then somebody actually wrote patches that load back into memory. So what ends up happening is uh, you read this content from the drive, you save a file, then when the file is reloaded, it applies a patch shoves it back into memory on the drive itself, and as long as power is still applied to the drive, it will continue to function at that point in time, turning off that function itself. But there's no way to write that back to the drive. The repair isn't written back to the drive. It'll continue to do that after it's powered off. But it's a combination of hardware and software that actually makes that happen, and it's about $15,000. Uh, well, I was just thinking of the thing from the little arch disk in there. Yeah. When they put the uh, security keys in there, it actually knows. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do that a lot on um, IBM drives. IBM drives have that similar kind of function. That's how we actually have to reset them. And we go through that process a lot, but that's not going to solve the Seagate problem with this particular thing. But there is pins on there, too, on the Seagate boards themselves that you can short so that they transmit the signal back but, and just put the drive in the pause mode. But it doesn't solve the problem so you can read your data. You, can't, you can talk to the SA area, but you can't talk to the data. You can't talk to user data. So... That's, that's the problem, is this CPU busy thing. But I know what you're talking about. I, I've seen it a couple times. And we trick them sometimes. Like if you actually write a password to a drive and we need to get the password off a drive, there are ways of doing a similar function like that to trick the drive into thinking that we're writing a new password and it clears the old password and returns instead. So, yes, sir? The first rounds that we had with these Western Digital drives with these new boards, a lot of us didn't understand them altogether because the problem with these fuses, we'd not seen a problem with 
usually if it was one fuse on the board, we could actually read the whole drive or we could skip around and we'd be able to read content. And it actually took a little while for most people to actually recognize that the problem was a PCB board problem. And so I revisited some drives after it was found out and then was able to actually recover data from them. But initially, they we're always like six months behind on whatever the current drive is that's released because somebody's got to actually buy them, have a problem, then develop the actual reverse engineering function of fixing those things and then distribute them. So we're always six or seven months behind on a problem. We still can't completely deal with the Seagate firmware problems. We can do some functions, but since Seagate changed their code completely in December of 2008 and their whole function, they actually used some stuff from their SCSI drives and stuff like that to actually change their functions. And we still can't do everything with all the 7200, 11, and 12 drives that are out now that we could do with Seagate drives prior to that. So we're kind of stuck in some things. Yeah. Oh no, you don't get any cooperation from a drive manufacturer. They suck. They do. They will not tell you anything and they're always worried about, you know, being sued or whatever. I mean, like right now, Seagate's got a major problem with a particular firmware problem. Again, another firmware problem that they're not directly addressing, that they've changed some code that we've already repaired and fixed, and then we don't have a way of actually fixing it again. And it'll have to be reverse engineered again. But they're not fixing them under warranty and doing the same stuff before. So there's some things that are happening there that's like, oh, well, we have a data recovery company. Why don't you send it to our data recovery company? Because Seagate has their own data recovery company. Seagate has their own data recovery company. Is that not a conflict of interest? <laughs> I, I don't know. So, but no, they are not helpful at all. You can't get any of that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of the data recovery equipment isn't even sold in the U.S. or you can't buy in the U.S. Because all this code in the ROM and all the stuff that's been reverse engineered, they, you know, they're trademarked or copyrighted or whatever the hell. You know, you can't reverse engineer stuff. So you've got to buy the stuff from China and Russia. Nothing's made in the U.S. None of it. Not a single thing. I can't hardly find anything made in the U.S. We have to buy it all from someplace else. So the closest manufacturer for most of this stuff is in, it's in uh, Canada, but they sell the Russian stuff from Canada. So... Any other questions? Nope. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you mean it starts decrementing its sizes because it changes its block sizes as it's as it it basically shrinks them down as it goes trying to do the repair on the sectors. But, I mean, are you saying that uh, that's all you got from the drive altogether? No, no. Oh, oh, yeah, no. As it, it starts with a larger block size, and it can shrink its block size as it goes. So it tries to do these. It's faster in UDMA mode to actually transfer chunks of data at one time and transfers it across the bus and into the drive. And then as time half, as it, as it gets worse, it goes back, and it tries to, to shrink that size down, sh shifting basically the size of the block size till it reads smaller and smaller chunks before it actually transfers the data. So that's why it's, it's decrementing its size as it goes till it gets down, only for speed purposes. Because uh, you could set it to its lowest possible value and then read every single sector and then transfer the sector, but it would take you forever. on Like a one terabyte drive, it might take you two months, three months to transfer the data. Buy hardware. Yeah, uh, DeepSpar Disk Imager will take care of that problem. Some of the problems that you can actually do, like you know, a week for DD Rescue, might take uh, two hours for a deep spar disk imager. A deep spar disk imager has one other function like I mentioned earlier. Um, it's the cheapest way to turn off a bad head. If you have one bad head, you can actually tell the system to turn off a bad head, read all the data from all the other platters, and still actually have a result that you can actually give back to the client or do whatever, um, and then fix the one head and fill back in the holes that you're missing. Uh, it actually has that function built in. It's the cheapest possible solution, and that's only come about this year. Uh, it, before, before May, we couldn't do it at all, not with this. We'd have to spend $15,000. Uh, these part disk imager is about $3,000. Okay, done. Thanks.